Yeah, so hello everyone and welcome to another Farm Advisor Service webinar. Uh, this is uh, the second webinar in this series of making the most of a small land area and this one is direct marketing. So I'm James Orr, James Orr and I'm your host today. We are having some IT issues I think due to the storm so that's why you're you're seeing this kind of strange desktop of mine and not the entire presentation. Oh, there you go, that's actually better. Right, so the, so we're looking through some housekeeping first. So if anyone else is having issues, such as hearing the speakers, viewing slides in the meeting, uh, so you can leave the meeting and rejoin using the original link button, or you can use the chat box to let us know and we can try and, uh, we'll try and fix it at our, our end. All right, so uh, that's what the chat box is used for. Try and refrain from putting pictures, uh, your questions in it, so we do have a Q&A tab. So onto that, uh, to ask a question. So you're all going to be muted throughout the event. Uh, if you have a question, you go down to your bottom left on the kind of taskbar, uh, and you'll see the Q&A tab. So we'd like you to use that. So enter your question in that, and we will get back to you. So the questions in this webinar will be all, all taken at the end, unless there's something extremely exciting. All right, so introducing our speakers from tonight. Today we have Aoife from Glass Rye Organic Farm. Hope I pronounced that correctly. And well, they're a real example of creating a, a business out of a small land area. And Aoife is going to tell us all about that. And um, we are also joined by Kerry Hammond from SEC Consultant, and she is an expert on direct marketing. So uh, I'm sure she'll have a lot of wonderful things to tell us. So I'm just going to stop screen sharing there. And Kerry, over to you. No, sorry, Aoife, over to you. My bad. I have. How's it going? Um, I'm going to screen share now my uh, presentation a little bit, but just want to say hello first. My name is Aoife O'Reilly and I am uh, run a small farm of seven acres in the west of Ireland. So I'm just going to get our presentation up and going. So um, I suppose we're, we're on a fairly small scale farm. We're uh, an odd size seven acres. It's sort of between a small farm and a larger vegetable farm, I guess, which would normally be, I don't know, a larger vegetable, organic vegetable farm here would normally be about 30 acres. There's not too many, actually. Um, so our background is Joe grew up on a, a dairy beef mix farm and he was working on the farm all the way through his childhood, like most farm kids usually are. Um, and then he went on, became a carpenter, so moved away from the farming. Um, and then, of course, there was an economic downturn. Work went short for carpentry, and he kind of got back into growing a little bit as a hobby. And um, we ended up meeting on an organic horticulture course. So it's kind of something we really have in common. It's something that came from either one of us, so we don't have to row about it too up too often. Um, I grew up in the countryside, so I'm not a total uh, urbanite, but um, we did not have a farm. We had two acres and I think we fattened a couple of calves occasionally. Um, so we persuaded Joe's dad to let us use three acres to start off with. So this was seven years ago. We're in our seventh year. So kind of a nice place to be at. Um, uh, we're certified organic. So we're through an organic body and uh, most of our selling is direct. So. This is why it's relevant here. Um, I'm going to move on now. I'll, I'm kind of, I'm giving you my story and then I'll go through a little bit, a few bits at the end. So basically our story was that uh, seven years ago, we started out with one commercial size polytunnel. We actually bought um, old mushroom houses um, because it was all the mushroom businesses went, went shut down in Ireland, pretty much all of them. And there was a lot of mushroom houses empty around the country. So one mushroom house would make us two polytunnels. So we just snapped them up, but it was a thousand a piece. Um, and then I yeah, had, a, had a few bits of extra steel and timber and stuff to add it to finish it off. Um, but we started off very small scale, quarter acre, uh, one large polytunnel. And we, um, we built a packing shed. It's probably one of the key things we did early on. 
Um, we had a small market then. Um, I'd say we were selling about 300 to 500 euros worth of stuff a week, and that was just in the summer. So, and then we had a small box scheme, which is basically when you, you have people who might pay 20 euro a week or 15 euro a week for a little box of vegetables, whatever's grown on the farm. It was nice and simple and tidy, and it was just us. We had a few volunteers. Uh, we borrowed a tractor. We didn't have a tractor. We pretty much had a blank field and no machinery. Um, uh, but we did have something that was a very useful resource, and I'm not sure if you have it there. We have a thing here. It's called a Start Your Own Business course. So it's like a financial incentive to get people to um, start their own business. So basically, for the first year of getting the business off the ground, um, you're entitled to the equivalent of, um, do you call it the dole? You call it the dole? Um, yeah, <laughs> equivalent of the dole. And then they gradually wean you off. So it just means that you have that little bit of income every week to survive on while you um, work towards getting an income yourself off the business. Um, so I suppose we started very small, but we were working on a lot of infrastructure and things. And uh, gradually moved up. We did a huge jump in year two, up to two acres, um, and um, lost a polytunnel in a storm, like all of it, all the steel bent, the whole thing. And uh, nothing has been more of an education for me than being out there in the middle of the night and watching how vulnerable a polytunnel can be in a storm. It's really, really a humbling. Um, so that was a bit devastating. We've just put it up and got the bars up, but it was a valuable lesson, um, which was to have all the infrastructure in place first, to make sure you've got your windbreak sorted, you know where your danger zones are. And um, we put in um, living windbreaks, we've planted loads of hedgerows, but also we have put in fences, temporary fences to cover us until the hedgerows take off. Um, so it was the most stressful year of our lives. We had a baby in the middle of summer and I, I gave a talk once before. And the main thing I wanted to emphasize was, was during that talk was like, if you want to get into this, the importance of uh, family planning and planning your babies for winter. Like that was, that was really pretty important. Our next baby came in winter, ideally enough, October is ideal um, for that kind of thing. So, we kind of, we, I suppose it was a very gradual uh, working up to seven acres. Um, the, the biggest jump was probably that year. And we kind of knew that we couldn't do that again, that we had to do better. So we took a gamble and uh, we hired some people. So year three of the business was the first year we really took on paid staff. Before that, we'd been onto volunteers we had. We paid some summer students to help us with weeding, carrot weeding time and things like that. We have a very mixed farm. I should say that we grow, I don't know, is it 60 something crops? Um, and we're always trying to expand the range a little bit, um, which does make it really labor intensive. I think you can stick to less crops and have a simpler system. But our whole idea is we want to supply farmers markets. So the more range you have, um, I think the better it is as a farmers market. Um, anyway, so employing people, we try to make it look like it's always good crack, even when it's muddy. It's not, <laughs> but, it, but the, I guess we're looking for that balanced view of uh, ruthless efficiency in the field and crack off the field, you know? Um, Cause I think what is, what was really interesting and probably one of my favorite things we've learned along the way is is how to keep and um motivate a happy farm crew and i think a happy farm crew is a very valuable asset um especially in terms of lifestyle because if you've got a happy team who are confident like you can take time off and that's where we find ourselves now. But we put in a lot of time and meetings and courses even in how to communicate with people, what people want from a job. Um, because basically in, in horticulture, the wages are never going to be super high. 
So you try to we try to balance that with like a, a nice workplace, flexibility, free food. Um, and then there's the cost of employment to take into account as well, because you don't even think of that at the start. You know, the uh, employers, PRSI, holiday pay, bank holidays, they're frightening when you're a first time employer. I mean, they're standard if you're an employee, you're so used to them. And I was employed before and I never thought about it. But yeah, it was terrifying to think of all those extra days when you're not going to be making money but you have to pay people all the same um so yeah small business uh trauma is uh getting yourself past that point and going okay we can do all that we can pay people holiday pay we can do the sick days all that sort of stuff we we, we can manage it um then so so as we started off i said we started off with a very small market about 300 euro a week um, it was actually in year two when we made the big leap up to two acres in production. Now we had a few second hand pieces of machinery and an old Massey 135, which is still our, our favorite tractor. Like it's wonderful, but it was, um, it's very basic and quite light. Um, and all the second hand bits of machinery are mostly lying around in people's farms. You know, those rusty bits you see like grown over, you can barely make out what they are and what pieces are missing. Um, we just, we kind of inherited a few of those and that was so handy. Um, yeah, so we took on a, a second market then, and that was in year two and it was, it was a good bit bigger. It was in a big town. And that, I suppose that, that's what push, put, put the push on us to uh, expand a little bit faster. Um, and then in, in our fourth year, we took on a, another market again, uh, a, in quite a prosperous time. We built this one up from scratch. So we just pestered the council for a trading license because it's a town that has a lot of people who have settled there from Dublin and London and moving out away from the big city life. And uh, they would probably have more of a disposable income than the other places where we were trading. Um, and actually, it was it was quite interesting how we got it because uh, we were just granted the license, and then we got a phone call from the manager who was a friend of ours of a, a supermarket um, in that town, and he said the shelves are empty. It was the twenty nineteen. There was an awfully bad winter. It was a lot of ice, a lot of snow, and the trucks couldn't deliver, and the supermarkets had no fresh fresh food. So uh, we went out and we set up in the snow and the ice and it was, a, it was a great market and it was a really great message, I think, to send to say, yeah, okay, the supermarket shelves are empty, but we're here and we have all this produce in the middle of winter. It was February. Um, yeah, it was nice. I'm proud of that moment, you know, that uh, it sort of says what we stand for a little bit. Um, in year four as well, we had two full-time employees and we had two part-time employees. Um, so we also started importing some produce then, um, organic produce, and that was from Europe. So we get a pallet load a week. Uh, mostly it's fruit, um, sometimes sweet potatoes, maybe ginger, things that we can't grow here. And the reason we started doing that was we found that Two things actually, over the winter, we were kind of losing customers a little bit. Our produce was a bit samey. A lot of people don't really want to eat parsnips and turnips and uh, cabbages all the time. Like that's quite an old fashioned diet. Um, so we decided to try it for a little while. The other issue here is, and possibly the same in Scotland, is our fruit supply is very, very poor, especially our organic fruit supply. Um, like we haven't been able to get an organic Irish apple to sell for the last two years, but the few years previous to that, we were able to get them in. Uh, they're just having bad years. Um, I suppose, and in the West of Ireland, our, our climate's quite damp. So there's a lot of disease spread in fruit. Um, but our aim is to try to, to build a, a fruit resilience here. So we've, we have uh, strawberries and raspberries now and uh, we would like to put down a small orchard in the future. But I mean, that's labor intensive too. So the more diverse you go, the more labor intensive it becomes. Um, but you just have to be, it's a careful balance of can you afford it and can you not? 
But the other side of employing people is we, we employ our team year round, which is quite rare. And importing produce allows us to do that because we're still making enough money over the winter to keep people employed. And there has been, I probably think it's the most valuable thing we've been able to do because we have a really great team on and we don't have to retrain a whole new team every spring, which is what a lot of farms will be facing into. Um, so that's about year four. Year five and six, not that interesting. We didn't do too much more. We got up to seven acres in production um, and that's our maximum. We are seven acres. Now there's green manure in some of that area actually because we rested some of the land. Um, and other things we did, oh, yeah, years five and six. Um, that's when lockdown hit actually, the first lockdown here. I don't know if you had such a strong first lockdown, but markets, farmers markets were closed. Um, everything just went a bit crazy. Um, but because we're quite, we're independent, we were able to keep our markets open. Um, so we were busier than we've ever been. Uh, because of, I suppose people got, were either cooking at home more, or people were more interested in healthy, organic, local food. I'm not exactly sure if it was a combination of those things, but it went massively busy. And our veggie box scheme, which is when we pack people's orders for them, uh, went nuts and we had to invest in a new website. And the website cost us 2,500 with a grant of 2,500. So it was a massive, massive investment. And we hated veggie boxes. We hated them with a passion because they took so long to make them for each person. And there's always like there's always feedback from them. You forgot this or you have to deal with like issues. Um, but I think that taught us that the more eggs we have and the more different baskets, the more resilient we are as a small business. Um, so I think we'll always keep that side of the business alive now just in case in case something happens and we can't go to markets for a few years or I'm not sure. Um, the, the other things we sorted out in that year was branding and labeling because um, of course we've got like, we got inspections from the HSE that that's a health board. We're subject to inspections from the Department of Agriculture and then our organic trust as well. So actually like last year, which was our sixth year, we had, a huge amount of inspections. They had the summer of inspections and we had everybody coming out and inspecting us for the first time ever. And it was uh, it was really fun. I really enjoyed that summer. Um, so I ended up doing heaps of paperwork uh, for all that stuff. And, and it's good, it's behind us now and we have everything in place. So going forward, inspection should be very clear. Um, um, but yeah, it's it's one of those things you are subject to a lot of inspections because you fall under a food category uh, uh, as as um, the health board would be over you there for selling at the market. And then you fall under the department, of course. And then, of course, there's the organic organic body. Um, so we had four, four full-time, the equivalent of four full-time employees plus me and Joe um, that, those two years. And the other thing we did actually, which is a bit interesting, let me see if I have it here is um oh yeah so we've been focusing a lot on green manures and this this is last year now this is our new no dig area so we're trialing a bit of no dig using a lot of uh, cover crops um to build fertility and hopefully that'll allow us to get out earlier than we'll get out into the field because uh it's already ready to go you know this will be ready to to crop straight away but to get out in the field you need the conditions to be right to get out there um, we've got so many systems in place. It's a lovely crowded packing shed on a Thursday, which is our packing day. Loads of bodies moving around, trying to squeeze past each other. Um, we have a lot of systems now. We've got at least five whiteboards and one notice board. Just everything's so systemized. And it's really, it, it makes things really clear. And then down the bottom here, this was something we introduced as well, which is our chicken tractor. Um, we hadn't really been interested in doing chickens, but actually it works really well in the system because uh, we put one section of the field into a long-term green manure and uh, the chickens will graze out and fertilize and that'll be out of action for uh, three years. So it's a good chance to um, give it a break and get a bit of fertility going. Um, 
That's the main things that we did. We're now in our seventh year. We have a great team of employees. They're all in their second year. So pretty much we can go on holidays whenever we want now. Um, we just got to log it in the calendar. We're like employees. We just go and say, we're going on holidays this day. Does anyone else need a holiday? And it's pretty, pretty freeing. Um, we have we have a turnover this last year, actually. The turnover was 290,000, which is pretty high. Um, the farm sales from the farm itself was 157,000. So the inputs actually, when I saw this, I was actually a bit shocked at, or the imports, 133,000. So that's quite a high quantity of imports, but it does show you that obviously people do want to buy their fruits alongside their vegetables. Do you know that it does keep the sales high to have that, that variety? Um, wages were 93,000. That's by far our largest cost. Um, but one thing I've learned as a key figure is if you keep your wages below 40% of turnover, um, this is what I got from our farm advisor. We're not doing too bad. So we just keep an eye on that. Um, so for now, our focus is to get right for the, the scale of the farm, as in to try to do we go smaller or do we stay where we are? We're not going bigger um, and we're not going to wholesale. We don't wholesale. Um, well, I lie actually, I'll, I'll talk about it very quickly. How am I doing for time? Have I got a few minutes going wholesaling? Versus yeah, you've got a few minutes. Okay, cool. Yep. Uh, so direct selling, I said farmer's market is our main outlet and farmer's market is our ultimately ideal outlet. There is no labeling, which is really expensive actually. Uh, no customer complaints. Like the, I suppose the weather is one thing. Yeah, we, we'll be out there in a storm on Friday. Um, we have pay two people to run the markets. And uh, it can be hard to find people to work weekends. Like that can be one thing that's actually a bit challenging. We try to rotate it so everyone has to do it. Um, and it's face to face with the customers, which is actually something we really enjoy. It's I think it's something the customers really enjoy as well. It's that thing that they can go and ask oh, if they're growing their vegetable garden or something and they have issues, they can run it past us or or they can ask what's coming into season yet. And do you know, it, it brings a, a more a closer relationship with your food as in you're seeing the changes as the seasons come along. Um, Maria, who runs one of our markets, she's a chef, so she's great at like giving people advice and and having that interaction like between food and, or plate and farm, I guess. You know, it's, it's uh, nice to have a connection there. So we do do the box scheme as well. Um, and for the box scheme, we pack that in the shed. Uh, probably we do 30 to 40 boxes at the moment. During the height of COVID, we were up to about 120. Um, it is the website has made that so much easier. I don't think we could have continued without the website. Um, and we stopped doing deliveries. And um, we've kind of tried to simplify things a little bit so we don't deliver. Uh, veggie boxes but you can pick up from the farm and you can pick up from the markets and we have a shop that you can pick up from as well and um i used to find with the veggie boxes too and i still do a little bit is you'll spend your weekend apologizing for mistakes which is not much fun i hate it i hate the groveling at the weekend oh, i'm so sorry i really apologize for that i just want to like switch off for the weekend so that's one thing to bear in mind because we do it on a friday and usually all the text messages now there's not that many at the moment but if if it does happen, it is coming in over your weekend. Um, we wholesale our gluts to other growers. Um, that's probably our main real wholesale event. We do do a few restaurants and we supply them with greens um, alongside other produce. But the greens, say greens, I mean salads, spinach, kale, chard are high value crops. So we'll only supply a restaurant if they're taking greens alongside other produce. It doesn't really make sense to supply them with, say, root vegetables, which would be very low value, um, unless they're balancing it with our high value crops. Um, we do we supply a supermarket with greens as well, and uh, gluts. Glut means when we've got the excess. So most there's a few periods during the summer where we'll have excess of certain crops that crop comes into production just when another crop is finishing and uh, yeah that's another thing we do actually is a lot of stagger planting to make sure we have a continuation of cropping throughout the summer 
like we might do three rounds of sowing of one certain crop so that when one crop one round of crop is finishing the next one starts and then the next one starts well this is in an ideal world sometimes uh, weather conditions aren't perfect but that's the idea um that's a bit about us i um I had one little useful piece of information that I had to share that I, I heard along the way. And it's kind of if someone's starting up, um, that key thing to bear in mind, it's very hard to know what scale you can manage. And someone had said that if one person can usually manage one acre with pretty much hand tools and a two wheel tractor, uh, should employ someone full time. And that's something I kind of wish I had figured out from the start, you know, to guess when you can pay yourself, what's the scale that you can start off with and make it make an income. Um, that's, uh, that's pretty much me. Um, the, the, I will say though, that it is really good for your ego to be doing something like this. because um, You just, you get a lot of recognition that feels really nice. Um, we, I had to do a podcast this morning for a crew called Farming for Nature. And um, it was a, a really nice feeling to be talking about something like that as in farming in relation to nature, not just farming for money. It's it's kind of a, a holistic approach, I guess. Um, and Joe's dad, who's very mainstream, I, I was talking to him about a farm, an organic farm here that's got huge investors from London behind them. And he said, oh, I'm not surprised if there's anything investors will be back in now, it's organics. And I never thought that I would hear him say something like that. Um, but I do think it's interesting that this might be the way farming may in some ways be moving. Overnight. Fantastic, Ethan. That was very interesting anyway. It's an amazing turnover you've managed to get uh, from such a small land area, which is exactly what this uh, webinar series is all about. Building a building a business at a small area. It's amazing you managed to employ people as well. Maybe anyway, we'll just move on to uh, Kerry. If you're still with us, Kerry. I sure am. Um, Eva, would it be okay if you yeah. stopped sharing? Yes, I should. I should. Thank do you. <laughs> um, I thoroughly enjoyed listening to you. And I think uh, I'm very glad that you went first because you've um, covered quite a lot of things that I know I don't have to cover. I'm thrilled with that. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to talk to you about direct marketing in terms of uh, the context for it, regardless of what you're selling. The best place to start, um, what your possible route to market options might be, and um, the digital issue. So, should you have a website? Should you not have a website? Social selling. I'm not going to encourage anybody to join an MLM or a pyramid scheme. That is all about social media. Um, and then I'm going to give away some free stuff at the end. Um, so, uh, Aoife, you hit on it perfectly that for what, whatever reason, and there are many when it comes to market research, COVID-19, as horrible as it's been and as awful as it's been, has shifted the perception and demand of local food, locally produced food, locally sourced food and provenance. So um, I think, uh, Aoife, you put it down to po possibly people actually looking at their own health, so looking for... Uh, you know, organic produce, you know, something they perceive as being better produce. There's also the way that people shop. Um, so a lot of people during the pandemic wanted to shop in less congested uh, environments. So doing something from a local producer helped them to do that. And also the delivery services that you mentioned as problematic as they can be um, with direct boxes and stuff. There was also, I think, an element of the, the local heroes, the people who were, you know, working through the pandemic to, as supermarkets got stripped of toilet paper and uh, dried pasta, you know, the, the local heroes, you know, our, our food producers, our heroes in agriculture were still there to fill it. So there's a, a huge opportunity when it comes to direct marketing for specifically food and drink producers. 
So uh, some people watching may have already started, some people may be considering it as a new venture. Um, when it comes to considering where you have to start, I would always advise that you start with why. So why should somebody buy this from you? But also, why do you want to do this? What do you want to get out of it? There's a little bit about capacity management there. So, you know, ultimately, are you starting a business that you want somebody else to buy? Are you doing it for purely turnover and profit reasons? Are you doing it because you want to build a team, build a brand? Are you doing it as a way to diversify income? Understanding the why of this direct marketing business will help you, but also considering why you're different and why somebody should choose you with what you're doing. I also think you have to start with who. Um, as Aoife mentioned, um, the, the direct part of direct marketing is the hard bit. Because unfortunately, with that, without people, without customers, you don't have direct marketing. And unfortunately, I think we all know that along with customers come uh, an element of customer management that's sometimes not the uh, easiest thing in the world to deal with, particularly on a Friday night. So being prepared for complaints, being prepared to be on 24-7, being prepared to deal with people who say they've ordered one thing and they've actually ordered another is a big part of preparing to get ready. Understanding whether are you the best person for that customer relations role or is there somebody else in the family or the business who might have slightly more patience with the text messages rolling in at 10 o'clock on a Friday night. I think you also have to be really clear on what your goals for the business are. So in order to have those clear goals, you need to have a plan. You need to know exactly what it is that you're trying to achieve and how you're going to get there. And it also helps to have a little bit of a budget. And this is particularly when it comes to the marketing piece of direct marketing. Um, there are few businesses that are lucky enough to get straight up and off the ground based on word of mouth alone. So knowing that there are going to be costs involved, that you're going to have to invest along the way, whether that's in training, whether it's in staff, or whether it's in the actual marketing activity, i.e. do you need a website or do you need to spend your time doing the marketing activity? Being prepared to spend a little bit on it is important. So some of the routes to market for direct marketing. So we've touched on box schemes. Um, you have heard some of the uh, issues when it comes to doing a box scheme. You have, you have to pick it, you have picking errors. If you're not doing a, a set box per month, then you have to deal with an awful lot of complex and different size, different value orders. Um, we also see with box schemes that they can be limited in terms of repeat custom because, for example, a meat box, somebody will be buying all of their meat in that meat box potentially for their whole family for the month. Whereas if you had a mixed ingredient box that included the vegetables, the dairy, a full basket box, as it were, you're more likely to get repeat custom every week. Um, Box schemes are a great opportunity to get subscription customers. Um, subscription customers, subscription model is a really, really smart way to do business because people actually have to go to the effort to cancel their subscription. And you would be surprised how many people don't cancel a subscription even if they want to. So subscription gives you really good forecasting tools. You know exactly how much income to expect for the next month, but you also know roughly how much product you're going to need. So there are pros and cons for box schemes. The next step along the route that some people consider is farm vending. So this is uh, less about sending out to people and hoping that people will come to you. Um, farm vending can be done on a, a very grand scale or it can be done on a very small scale. Um, we see there are uh, a number of um, very interesting enterprises who have built purpose-built farm vending shops where there isn't a human being in sight. Uh, they go in in the morning, they stock up their vending units and you can go in and you know pay by contactless, open up all your drawers, get whatever you need. 
In terms of stock management, this is great for the for the vendor. It's great for you as a business owner because you can live track on your in your app and your computer. You can see exactly what's in demand. You can see what needs to be stocked and when. You can track um, shelf life, how long something's been there. Um, but it does take away the human interaction piece, which I think when people go to particularly a farm shop or a market, that's actually what they're looking for is that sort of interaction, personality, and a little bit of that does get lost in vending. There's also the consideration with vending is it's a, it's a big outlay. That's a, a big investment if it's the first time that you're going into doing something. Um, there are less high tech vending options like honesty boxes that have been around for donkeys. Um, I'm not going to go into the pros and cons of the honesty box because I think honesty is the, uh, the both the pro and the con of the honesty box. Um, but there are lots of different options. And this is the kind of thing that depending on when you go back to that question at the start, why are people buying from me? What is it that I want to do and achieve? If it's to sell your produce without having to deal with customers, then a robot is a pretty good way to go. So understanding what your goals, your plan and your uh, action points are will help you make the decision about which route to market is the best for you. Um, click and collect. So uh, Aoife mentioned uh, you guys do click and collect. And I think you said you do click and collect from they can come to the farm they can come to the market and they can also collect from uh an independent shop is that correct Eva? uh yeah and okay. have you have you found i'd be really interested but have you found that again since covid19 is this something that more people are interested in availing themselves of uh it did happen at the start of covid19 it dropped off slowly where people preferred coming to market. Um, so I don't think it's a long term thing that COVID-19 has massively affected it. Probably dying for some uh, human interaction and to go and do something with the weekend rather than just clicking and collecting. Um, there are more and more farm shops particularly offering uh, click and collect as an option. Uh, it's something that Again, we tend to see works better with the more full basket an option you have available. So if you have more than one type of produce, um, so for example, being able to sell fruits alongside the veg, give people more choices and more options, then they're more likely to buy a higher volume. With click and collect, smaller orders tend to be quite unusual. People will tend to do a, a larger order in order to come and pick it up in advance. Which then brings us to e-commerce, because of course, most click and collect, it's, it's rare that you would do a click and collect order over the phone. Most click and collect will have to be done online through an ordering system. And it's, again, unusual that you would see click and collect without also having a direct delivery option. So when it comes to e-commerce, there are, again, there are pros and cons to every route to market that you can consider. In order to have a successful e-commerce operation, you A, have to have a website, you B, have to understand how to use that website, you have to be able to put products on, you have to be able to keep an eye on your stock, you have to process all of your orders correctly. And I think you have to be very switched on to the fact of how digitally aware customers are. Um, it's it, it's not really enough anymore just to have a, a price list of your produce on your website and hope that people will send you an email to order. People expect it to be a click through, easy, add to basket uh, process. And people are also looking for different payment option, option types like Apple Pay, PayPal, Visa Pay, direct things from people's phones. So what makes a, a good website? Um, I think there are uh, so many things that make a good website and many, many things that make a terrible website. Ultimately, at the end of the day, it needs to be very user friendly and easy to navigate. It should be simple enough that nobody gets lost, but it should also highlight all of the best parts that you have to offer. Um, I do quite a lot of uh, 
individual reviews with clients of their websites, e-commerce sites, and their selling platforms. And all too often, you can't actually find the button that allows you to click to buy a product. You have to scroll through pages of stuff to be able to buy something. So keep, again, those goals in mind. Go back to that action plan. What do you ultimately want people to do? You want people to buy something from you. Make that the key goal of your website. Um, Arn Pryor, um, we use as a, a really nice example of uh, web development done well. Um, it's simple, it's very cute, it's aesthetically pleasing, it's modern, uh, it's very brand aware. So as soon as you're on their website, you know exactly what their website's giving you. It's giving you pumpkin patches. Um, the other thing that it does incredibly well, though, is the, the functionality and the way it separates out their offer. So they have the pumpkin patch as their, their main sort of income driver, but they also have their glamping, their swimming pool, and they do live lambing. So they've very neatly on their main page shown you exactly what it is that they do and allow you to go from there. Um, Mobile sensitivity is also hugely, hugely important. So uh, more people use their mobile phone to access websites than use PCs. Um, so it has to be mobile compatible. Um, we quite often get asked questions about whether is it better to do your own website because it's quite expensive to, uh, to have a web developer design you something. And there is, you know, there's a cost benefit analysis to do there, if you like. You, uh, you absolutely can design your own website. There are um, sites such as Wix and WordPress that are designed for you to basically create an idiot proof website. I, it will do the job as a landing page if you don't require it to do anything too technically challenging. However, if you are looking to set up an e-commerce site and to sell and fulfill orders from your website, I would always recommend speaking to a professional web developer to do it. There will be a, a bit of cash investment into it, but it will reduce problems for you down the road. And more importantly, it reduces problems for your customers. So that uh, gives you far more chance of repeat business, which is the most important kind. Um, if you insist on creating your own website, there is a little guide here uh, from HubSpot on how you can create and manage your own website. There is also a, a link here to Business Gateway's Digital Boost program. Um, so any Digital Boost in the country, you can sign up to basically do a free course to learn how to do your own um, website and do your own digital management. Um, but they're also worth speaking to because occasionally they have loans, digital boost loans and digital boost grants. So for depending on where you are in your business journey, you may be able to access a little bit of funding to get a website developed. So I'm going to move on to social selling. Um, it's key if you've got a website, if you're selling something online, it's key that you have social media to back it up. Um, a website is effectively a beautiful shop window built in the middle of a dark forest if you don't have social media pointing towards it. Social media are the signposts and they are the paths to your shop. So if you're going to start on the digital journey and set up a website, it's really imperative that you also create some social activity around about it. Um, the, the most commonly used social platforms these days are Facebook and Instagram. They're the two that I'm going to focus on in terms of this session. Um, they're the two that are most commonly used for selling things directly. So um, there's a couple of examples here, a couple of different businesses who are good examples of people who use social media quite well in order to sell things. Something that if you're interested in having a look, I would encourage you to do so after the webinar this evening. Um, uh, a little, uh, I think a little used asset on Facebook particularly is Facebook groups. Um, 
if you are selling on Facebook already, you know about Marketplace, you're potentially already selling on Marketplace or you're using your Facebook to list your items for sale. But something that you might not be doing is actively promoting and selling in Facebook groups. So this is a, a, a big opportunity to find particularly new markets and to reach out to uh, new potential customers who may not have heard about you or have found your uh, your own website or your own social media uh, before. Um, we would generally say when it comes to using Facebook groups for marketing, you always have to check the terms and conditions of any group that you're joining because some will have a no sales policy and they're definitely not worth joining if you're looking to sell in them. Um, this is something, everything that uh, is being discussed tonight is just the uh, tip of the iceberg, but everything that's being discussed, um, you can contact the um, Farm Advisory Service helpline and ask for some more advice or information on any of these things. So if you wanted to know more about how you set up your business as a Facebook marketplace or as a Facebook business account, you can contact us to ask for help with that. Um, you, uh, the, the beauty of the Facebook groups for selling is that you can cross sell. So, uh, for example, farm machinery is a really common um, thing that you find for sale in Facebook groups. But anywhere where farm machinery is being sold, you are likely to find people that are interested in whatever it is that you have to sell. Something else that um, Facebook groups can be set up for is the uh, the farm kitchen or the home visit style of marketing. So um, there is a, a business in the northeast of Scotland called Louise's Farm Kitchen. Um, they do rare breed pork and she's set up a Facebook group which is called Louise's Farm Kitchen. And you have to be a member of the group uh, in order to buy from her. You have to pre-order. Um, everything is pre-ordered a month in advance. Uh, the only sales happen in there, so it feels very exclusive, but she sells out of all of her stock every single month. She makes exactly what she wants to make. And then ultimately people go to her house, to her kitchen to pick up the items that they've discussed in the group. So it takes a, a, a colder social interaction and it turns it into a much more personal um, interaction and experience. Instagram, you can also sell from Instagram. Uh, you can link your Instagram to your Facebook marketplace. Um, there are, it depends on what kind of e-commerce system you're using and it depends on what kind of plugin you're using, whether you can actually set up one click purchasing from Instagram. Um, when it comes to food and drink particularly, Instagram is a really key platform for social media selling because Instagram is all about the experience. Instagram works solely based on photo and mostly video content and food performs very, very highly in that category. Um, again, a, a general piece of advice about using Instagram. Um, if you think about your grid, the things that you post on your main profile page <clears throat> as being that shop window idea again. So you're merchandising yourself, your brand, everything that you're selling on your main grid, but then use the story function to give people the experience as though they've come in to speak to you in person. Because again, direct marketing is all about building the relationship with the customer. <clears throat> Excuse me. So again, we've got some examples here of some businesses that use Instagram direct marketing incredibly well. So there's Westerton, Lunan Bay and South Powery. There are many great examples. These are just some that if you have a look at some of their content, they do um, persuasive marketing really well. So they're not necessarily shouting in your face and asking you to buy now and purchase straight away, but they use quite a, a soft, personable and influential style in order to get you to want to find out more. Something which has uh, cropped up recently, which is becoming a little bit more popular, is selling via WhatsApp. Um, WhatsApp is actually the second largest a social network platform in the world and most people don't consider it a social network. 
Um, you can actually set up a business account on WhatsApp and you can use it as a selling tool. So uh, you have to be using some form of business mobile device. You have to have access to your emails. You have to do you have to make sure that you're set up with all of your price lists, anything that you would need to be able to send directly on WhatsApp. You, it's probably worthwhile looking at using the WhatsApp web app if you're going to consider doing it. So um, many people don't know that you can actually take WhatsApp and put it on your computer. Um, this means that if there's more than one of you uh, selling or in the office, two or three of you can be speaking to your customers with the same voice, the same voice of the business. You can be handling multiple inquiries at once. One of the big benefits, I think, of using WhatsApp as a selling tool is, in a way, it's kind of replacing email marketing. Um, I know most mornings I wake up, I have anywhere between 11 and 17 emails in my personal email inbox, which is people trying to sell me absolute nonsense. And I unsubscribe from all of them. And uh, usually by the next morning, I'm sitting with the same amount again. So there's a, a, an ever increasing movement to people stopping email marketing because it's effectively throwing money away, but moving that uh, activity over onto WhatsApp. Um, you do have to have the person's mobile number and their consent for you to message them um, ahead of using it. But something that I've seen ever more people doing is you'll probably have seen it yourself when you go to a business's Facebook profile and you go to message them on Facebook Messenger, it actually takes you to their WhatsApp. So you can now replace the messaging options on both Instagram and Facebook with your WhatsApp directly. So that allows you to manage it almost as a customer CRM system. It takes out a lot of different management issues. So if people are complaining over Facebook that they haven't had the items that they thought they were gonna get, you get it all in one place. It allows you to promote to all of your customers in a way that they feel natural. They feel like you have sent them that message directly rather than it being email marketing. And you can use it to send the kind of content that you think that your customers are going to be interested in. Um, just to kind of round up, I think it's really important to say that videos are the most important type of content that you can use online. Um, the majority of uh, engagement that we see when it comes to online marketing activity is with video content. And here's the free stuff that I have to give away to you. So from this evening, I'll just reiterate, if there's anything that you would like to find out about in depth, please do contact the Farm Advisory Service Helpline and uh, they'll be able to put you through to myself or one of our colleagues who can help you. If you want to find out more about using Facebook for business, Instagram for business, WhatsApp for business, or how to make better video content, then there are five external links there that you can click through. And I also just wanted to highlight some of the resources that I've created over the past few years for the Farm Advisory Service. So they're all available on our website. So how to write a marketing plan, how to develop your brand, how to tell a story, how to capitalize on PR, which is a series of podcasts if anyone's not a fan of reading. And then we've also got a, a whole topic page on the Farm Advisory Service website on adding value resources. So any form of sort of direct marketing or looking to add value to farm produce, you can find all of those resources there. And if anyone wants to contact me directly to ask any questions, then I am more than happy to have a chat anytime. Fantastic, thank you very much, Kerry. Uh, hopefully everyone can hear. It seems to be that I'm having the worst connection issues out of, out of everyone. Uh, from what was said in the chat functions, which is good. And else is having, well, not as many folk. Uh, so, I mean, in addition to what Kerry said there about uh, contacting the Farm Advisory Service, there is grants offered through the Farm Advisory Service that could help you. Uh, for example, the Integrated Land Management Plan, which is usually a kind of business appraisal plan, but we can use it to uh, plan for the future. So plan a new enterprise, look at your different options. Again, specialist advice could also be used to kind of add to those plans to kind of maybe 
assess your soil soil nutrition things like that as well as uh, uh, kind of I all your kind of different <clears throat> loads of different plans that are under that umbrella of special advice that could help you as well as that there's a fully funded carbon audits which could be a really good a uh, tool for you to use to market your produce. So if you're if you're like Efa and you're producing uh, uh, veg boxes, you could show your carbon footprint. You could show that it's perhaps lower than lower than what's available at the supermarket. So it could be another uh, string uh, to your bow when it comes to marketing. Uh, so again, more meetings that we've got in future. We've got one coming up in two weeks' time. Uh, it's another the final webinar in this series, and that is in agritourism. So. I hope to see some of you there. But we'll move on to questions. Uh, so we did have some questions come in. Hold on. Just to get back to the webinar. Can everyone hear me fine? Yeah. So Aoife, you answered this question in the, in the Q&A function, uh, but they're asking about how do you find labour? I know you touched on it in your, in your presentation. So have you got any top tips to kind of keep a happy, a happy, competent labour force? Oh, we're learning all the time. This is my biggest lesson in, in humanity is figuring out what makes people happy, what brings them job satisfaction. We have a lot of meetings with our staff. Um, we talk about what they want to do every year. We involve them in the farm a lot in the farm planning. Um, we do a lot of farm walks with them. We try to set up a social side to it too. As in the farm, all of us go on farm walks to other farmers' farms together and discuss it. We do brainstorming sessions. We might have a like an idea like uh, waste management or bringing biodiversity or something like that, and we'll just have a brainstorm session about it. Um, it's very interesting, like how to keep people happy because it's not just about the wage. And I think that's what's kind of key because people don't really want to work in a job they don't like for pretty low wages like compared to what you might get say if you went into an office or something you'd probably be on higher wages um having said that no one's on minimum wage here we're all above minimum wage but i would say we're all a, a little below living wage uh we're in a very cheap part of the country as well though and um yeah it's a struggle for a lot of farms I think here and probably more so in Scotland because you're going to have issues with people coming uh, from abroad to work there too. Aoife, do you think that the uh, having the opportunity to rehire them every year and you know it's not a seasonal contract, do you think that helps with your staff retention? Um, we I think the staff retention that the, the way it's working for us is that people are staying on over the winter and we can keep them paid over the winter and we'll encourage them if they want to take unpaid time off. We're like very flexible. A lot of people will want to do that, um, to do things like that. Or um, There's a lot of different ways you can be flexible with time, but we do keep on people on a full-time basis year round. Um, but I do think rehiring at the start of every season will mean you'll lose people, um, lose good staff risky. Aoife, uh, we've got another question for you here. Uh, how many laying hens do you have? Is there dem a local demand in the markets for the eggs? Are they certified there organic? There and is a shed in the background of your presentation? They're housing. So there's four uh, questions in one. There's a movable house. I don't know if you saw that. It was It's a chicken tractor on wheels. So it's built on the an old caravan chassis and we right. drive it around by tractor so it's rotational grazing on our uh it's a multi-species long-term green manure that they're on um we have only 100 uh where we don't have a huge amount of space so it's not something we want to go really big on there's a lot of demand for organic eggs um but i think in our system we're just using it as a part of the system rather than trying to expand it right as there's a kind of symbiotic relationship between the, the chickens and the, yeah. and the veg. And I think that's that's the way it works. <clears throat> I think if you wanted to get economies of scale into it, you were going to have to go bigger. But I think for us, we're, uh, a little bit of manure is, you know, a little bit of grazing is actually a pretty productive part of the system. 
Uh, so obviously one of your your main kind of outputs, your main kind of well, your main kind of market is the kind of the farmers markets. What kind of infrastructure and kind of like or top tips have you got for people looking to start selling there? As in selling. Yeah. Yeah. So at the at a farmers market, obviously you can take you can probably just take a a kind of small kind of gazebo. Just a little gazebo. Some, some, yeah. No, it's nice. We have it branded, so it looks good um mm. but the farmers markets we're at actually it's quite interesting they're not really farmers markets um the farmers market culture here is pretty much dead um so it's basically us in a market square with maybe one or two other traders there so it's not like a bustling farmers market like you might imagine um we're just kind of horsing our way into a central area and setting up a stall. Again, we've got another question for you for, uh, from Arthur, who is looking to set up a, a market garden in the west coast of Scotland, so quite a, a wet area of Scotland, uh, looking to set it all up along, uh, or well, looking to become certified organic. Uh, but he's got an issue that he's got uh, rushes in a field. I don't know if you've heard of rushes in Ireland, if he's had the same issues over here. Never seen a rush. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm only kidding. We both are. Yeah, we're in the rush territory. Right. Uh, so he's wondering how he'd get rid of them in an organic friendly way without uh, spraying them. Okay, it's a tricky one now because one thing I'd say is if you're going growing vegetables, it really pays to have good land. Um, you can grow vegetables on boggy land. You're just going to work a lot harder at it. Um, to deal with the rushes, um, anyone I know who's dealt with rushes, it's a constant cutting job. Um, just constantly cutting, weaken them, cutting them, weaken them, cutting them, weaken them. Um, that is what I have heard has worked for people. We don't have rushes. We are lucky enough to have good land. But yeah, if, as a market garden, you, you're going to work hard to build your soil on a very boggy site i think yeah not to discourage yeah, I, 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 I know but, people who do sorry. sorry james oh, sorry i was i was me that interrupted apologies i was going to say that there are lots of resources in the farm advisory websites uh particularly about the control of issues there's been some experiments done from sec consultant on that matter they've not been organic studies so it's not it's not solely been uh, organic control measures. There has been pesticides involved in some of the different parts of the trial, but they have looked at just solely cutting, and they have looked at other things to to control it. So things like drainage, uh, making sure your pH is correct, uh, they help. And again, as as Aoife said, repeated cutting. Uh, so if I've got a question here, how many employees have you managed to support on the seven acres? your farm uh last year we had the equivalent of four full-time plus joe's my husband and i i'm down to i'd say one day a week now on the farm maybe two um that's a lifestyle choice as i'm homeschooling mm -hmm. and have three young ones yep so that was that was four full-time and Joe, so and five full-time. Part -time. Yeah. Five full-time. Fantastic. Amazing. Uh, we do have, I think we've got a chat here. So we've got an, another answer to offer here. This uh, Katie who uses pigs to get rid of rushes. It's certainly a, a novel approach, which certainly could fall under the organic category, I suppose. Thank you for that, Katie. Uh, so one of the things you mentioned was the uh, importance of kind of implementing systems when you're working, when you were talking about the actual kind of the packaging part of the business. Have any kind of top tips when it comes to designing symptom, uh, symptoms, systems? Sorry, I missed part of that, James. I didn't quite catch it. You hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it was... You'd said uh, earlier on in your presentation about the importance of kind of implementing systems to make that show kind of work easier when you're doing the packaging specifically. Do you have any top tips about how to design systems that work for 
do business? Uh, so, I'm sorry, I got a little <laughs> sidetracked there. So you mean uh, packaging, is it? I get it. I think what I think James was saying, you design the you know the whiteboards and the pinboards oh, in yeah. your pictures where you, you told us about the systems that you've implemented. Ah oh, yes. Do you have any top tips about how a business might want to start addressing implementing new systems? Yeah, it's interesting. To be honest, it was really hard to do it from the start because I feel like everything's you're just figuring out everything from the start. Um, like lists are beneficial when you're managing a team, as in we'll have different lists for different people because their areas of speciality are, are better. Um, we have like a very clear harvest board that gets inputted into a computer then. So the end of the year, I guess it makes things easier because the end of the year, say the department of agriculture could ask me how many kilos of something i grew and i can just check like on the computer it's made it very clear and seed sowing charts um everything like that is straightforward and then it, the i guess when you need to make a change then it's a very simple matter of finding your system and making a tiny change i'm not sure if this is exactly answering the question is it all right I, th I think that answered the question. I find it tricky, yeah. James, because I, yeah. I don't know. From the start, I think it's very tricky to have uh, a lot of systems in place. I think it takes a while to develop what you see as successful systems. Yeah, and uh, also involving, you're talking about keeping a happy team, involving your employees in the, the designing of those systems, letting them have some influence on the business and the way it works. Yeah, I think it's great. So, so Kerry or Aoife, do you have anything to add? So if not, we've got no more questions, it looks like. Uh, I think just the, 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 the one thing that I, I would say, it's like the boring bit that I didn't really want to uh, include in my slides, which is about uh, legislation, regulation, um, making sure that you've got all of that covered. So it is it is you know crucially important that particularly if it's food that you know you know everything you need to know about food safety standards you know you're in touch with your local environmental health officer you know you know if you're making product that's going through a production uh, line that you know you've got all of the correct certification allergens is a big deal packaging is a big deal labeling is a big deal um there's a lot of resources available um, some of it is really really good uh, reading material for uh, insomnia sufferers um, but again if if there is if you have a product or products in mind and you're unsure about your legal obligations or regulations around it please do get in touch because we can save you a bit of that bedtime reading and put you onto the exact um resource that you need to be using or looking at it's my yeah, absolutely least favorite thing to discuss is regulations but it also <laughs> yeah especially i mean if you're talking about having that approaching them first that having that proactive relationship with people like the environmental health officer and uh, food standards is always good to have a proactive relationship so if something goes wrong you've already got a a good relationship and it they might be a bit uh, easier on you yeah or work with it. you rather than scolding you like a child which we yeah. like we like being worked with yeah. all right well i'll just share my scene again we'll go on to the kind of final uh, housekeeping <laughs> uh, so well thanks all everyone for listening and uh, thank you to Aoife and Kerry for lending their experience and vast level of knowledge to this webinar. Uh, I've certainly learned a lot, I've certainly enjoyed it, uh, despite the technical issues with this uh, storm that's happening outside the window. 
Uh, so the final thing I'd like to ask you all to do is to fill out the feedback forms. So this webinar is paid for by the Scottish Government, so they like to see some feedback forms, they like to see an effect that these webinars are having an effect for people, that these are, these are learning things, that, that they are useful. So in order to do that, we need these feedback forms filled out uh, to justify to the government why they're paying for this. Uh, and to incentivise you, there is a £50 voucher every month, won by somebody that fills in a feedback form. And that is either the Battlefield Bakery or Damn Delicious. And they are both local to me, and I can tell you they are fantastic. So I'd highly recommend you do it to be in for, for a shot of winning. So thank you very much for listening, and we'll just end the webinar there. Thank you.